Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest Tammy Lynn Stoner, and she's here to share with us her new novel, Sugarland. Now, Tammy's work's been selected for more than a dozen published collections and literary journals. She was nominated for a Million Writers Award and earned her MFA with Antioch University. Stemming from what her grandmother calls her gypsy blood, Tammy has lived in 15 cities working as a biscuit maker, a forklift operator, a gas station attendant, and a college instructor, among many other jobs. She's the creator of Dottie's Magic Pockets and the publisher of Gertrude Press, based in Portland, Oregon. So let's welcome to the show, Tammy Lynn Stoner. Hi, thanks for having me. What a pleasure it is to have you here, and how exciting your new book was just released. Yes, it just released October 23rd, so it's hot off the press, yeah. Hot off the press, and you know, and actually, what a great time to be talking about your new book. My goodness, so I've got to ask you, I mean, your book, Sugarland, it, it covers a lot, and we're going to get into some of it today. What inspired you to write this book? Well, it was kind of a multi-layered inspiration, I guess. Um, I had had a couple of short stories that were all very Southern and all centered around this one family, but they were in different points of view and that sort of thing. And I, when I was workshopping them, somebody had suggested that I turn it into a novel, <clears throat> which I, I am predominantly a novel writer, but I had had such a terrible <laughs> um, novel before this one uh, <laughs> that I spent 10 years on and it became this monstrous <laughs> thing that I took apart and put back together and changed the point of view and it, and it just got out of control and I vowed I would not write another novel, you know, for like five years. It was like a bad relationship, like a terrible breakup. And so I, when somebody suggested this, I thought, oh God, you know, it does seem like it should be a novel, but each little short story had its own arc and it didn't really have a full narrative arc. And then I, I read the story of Lead Belly and realized that, you know, we were dealing with similar themes as to what he dealt with for his entire life, but notably the story around his incarceration at Imperial State Prison Farm. And when I read that, I thought, oh, you know, I could, I could blend these, I could blend the historical story of Lead Belly in with this Southern, the development of the Southern family and kind of use the theme of breaking out of imprisonment as, as the, the thing to, to, for me to hold on to so that I wouldn't, so that I wouldn't ruin this novel the way I did the previous one. So there's many inspirations. Well, you know, it's a common thing with writers, I hear. You know, good yeah. and different. When a book's been written, I've, I've heard of other novel, uh, novelists that when they've written a book, it could be a New York Times bestseller, and then they don't want to write again. Um, we actually talked to one here mm. about a year ago. Didn't want to write another book because nothing would be as good as that book. And so you look at it, and it's interesting how we kind of prejudge. And I'm so glad you wrote Sugarland because it's, I mean, it's getting such great reviews. People are loving this book. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) That's always nerve-wracking, you know, putting something out there and waiting for the the feedback. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel that way, but it may just be because I'm a a little bit, I lean more on the prolific side of, of the writing world, even though it takes me forever. So I actually already have another book or actually I have two more books that are already written so for me that pressure of you know that that pressure's off you know this can become the biggest hit in the world and I I still have these other two that I love as well but you know so I'll I don't have the I think the pressure of having not written something while something else gets you know all this sort of spotlight Moving from there. Well, do you know, and hey, we're glad that you're, you're writing and we can't wait to hear about your other books that are coming. I'm sure you've got many, many more books coming up <laughs> in your <laughs> writing career. <laughs> which is I hope so. <laughs> well, and so when we talk about, gosh, you know, the blending of this historical fiction, you know, Let Belly, he was quite a character and it's interesting to find this piece of a true story that really inspired you. And I would love for you to share a little bit about, you know, Lead Belly's story. Well, um, the, the piece of the story that, um, that it really pivots the book a lot is that he was incarcerated in, uh, in Imperial State Prison Farm, that's down in Chicago, Texas. 
1923, and he sung for a release from the governor from Texas then, Governor Neff, who had actually run on a platform that he was not going to release or was not going to offer as many pardons as his predecessor had. So he, but Lead Belly uh, got a 12-string guitar in in um, Sugarland Penitentiary and sung for a release um, at sort of a picnic for the guards, uh, and the governor came and sung for a release from the governor using a song, and the governor granted him release from prison. And so, and it was on the last day in office. So I think the governor was like, I'm going to give parole to this violent, you know, notorious criminal uh, who sung this beautiful song, and and then I'm out. <laughs> so he, when I heard that, that the power of, that somebody's music had, that they could sing in the most unlikely of, of times, you know, to sing from prison to a, a hardened governor and get granted a release, I, I just, you know, that, that inspiration was, you know, there from the, from the start. But that's the part of his life that, that I focus on and the part that inspires the rest of my narrative. Well, I, I think it's such a fascinating story, and I love how you blended that all together. And what's interesting, while, you know, he's a, a very um, strong character within the book, he's not the main character. Right. Yeah, he he inspires the main character and continues to do that, and she actually visits him towards the end of the book um, on his sort of deathbed in New York. She travels there from from Sugarland to visit. So it, it, they have just this real, um, almost spiritual connection because given that they were in prison together, she was the cook in the prison and he was in the prison. Um, they didn't have a lot of time to really become um, friends in the traditional way, but they just connected right off the bat. And um, and he, although his presence is only there, I think for maybe, oh, I don't know, 15% of the book, uh, he really is, is something that comes to her throughout the rest of her life as an inspiration. Wow. That's just a very interesting because, I mean, your book, and we were talking about this a little bit ago, I mean, you cover some pretty, you cover all the, you know, heavy topics of that time we've been concerned, and some of them were really taboo. I mean, we've got prohibition, we have civil rights, we have gay rights. And so it's interesting, you you really did such a beautiful job weaving that all together and addressing them in, in many ways. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It, it was, um, it you know, it was just the time that was happening. So it allowed me the freedom to have these events happening around, you know, around the, the narrative. I think it, it goes from 1923 to 1968. So it covers that big chunk of time when we had so much happen in the United States and in the South, notably. So I was really, it was a real pleasure to be able to, uh, you know, to, to do the research and to, to address those, those time periods. Well, and how long did the research take you? Well, um, I'm, I am sort of a, uh, I'm, not, I'm a trivia geek, but then it really goes a lot deeper than that. So I'm constantly researching stuff anyway. So it's sort of an endless quest on for me to to acquire this odd knowledge about things but this this one I you know I probably researched it for maybe three years um and fun funnily funnily enough uh the the main chunk of the research that I really required didn't come to me until after I had written and sold the book <laughs> and then I finally got a hold of these micro filmed uh, articles that, that down in Texas, they, the Beaumont Library, they, they sent me copies of them. And it had, and then I had to go back in and make some pretty significant editorial changes to the book based on these, uh, on, on the research that had come. So I was researching from the time I started it, literally up until just months before we went to press, uh, to make sure that I could keep things as accurate as possible. Well, and um, why do you think it was important for you to write this book overall? You know, um, that's a really interesting question. Sometimes, well, there's kind of a strange belief, maybe strange to some folks, but that that there's sort of uh, stories out there or ideas out there, or even, you know, spirits from the other side, you know, whatever you want to believe in, that come to people and they, they just have a story to tell. And, and it really did feel that way in, for this particular book, um, that, that, that this, this person just you know, wanted to be written. But beyond that, I think, um, you know, I had sort of had a 
a little a little bit of imprisonment myself, you know, when I was younger, you know, really struggling with issues about being gay or queer or whatever you want. And so it was, I think it was also really empowering for me to, you know, to write this person that struggled a, a lot in the beginning and struggled with society and with family and that sort of thing. And then at the end, you know, becomes this really flamboyantly, you know, delightful, you know, character in a, in a trailer park down in, down in the South, you know, living with pugs and, you know, grandchildren and, and her, you know, and her partner who's the local seamstress, you know? So I, 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 for me, I think it was just, I wanted to write this story. I I wanted to get away from sort of the, the narratives that, you know, that, that, you know, gay, gay narratives have typically ended, you know, not so well <laughs> for if for a lot of a lot of time, and and that's just not the case. I mean, you know, that's not the case with my friends and my life or my my history. But so I think that it was really important for me to sort of write the happy ending. Well, and I'm so glad that you did because you're right. You know, when we look at you know books that that have characters or address you know gay rights or what have you, a lot of times there is this really bad connotation. But that a lot of it has to do with you know, and I loved how the main character talked about how not only society was kind of viewing her and how she felt personally, but she also briefly was also considering, like, from a spiritual point of view, that people thought that, you know, that she should, like, you know, go to hell, which is, right. you look at all the struggles that, you know, that people who are within the GBTQ community, what what they have to go through, but that doesn't mean that they can't be, you know, that we can't be happy at the end. Yeah, you know, and and I I definitely think that the narratives that dominated a lot of writing where there are just happen to be gay characters doing something in them, you know, they come from reality, you know, it comes from, you know, a lot of abuses that, you know, whether it's the church or society or even, you know, your friends or whatever, but it doesn't, I think that those narratives were necessary to be told, but there are also other narratives out there too. And, you know, in this one, what I felt like is that it was just sort of universal. You know, I mean, she, she just wanted everyone to know really who she was. And part of that is a great part of that is who she loves. And so in her struggle to really um, connect with her, with her family, she, she realized that that was just a really important part of it. And I think that's true. Um, for people from, for, for all different kinds of reasons, you know, for all different kinds of reasons, just the struggle to be true to who you are compared with what people want you to be. And, um, and then to just say, no, you know, this is really who I am. And if you want to, if you want to know me and love me, then this is, you know, this is, this is it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, and, and there's something about living an authentic life where you're feeling like you know, you're saying you're being true to yourself, you know, because it, um, doing, Living a life where you're looking to meet other people's expectations comes with a lot of consequences. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, in the book it talks about, you know, uh, the main character, she gained some weight. And it, it's just, you know, and, and there's a lot of you know, just emotional things that are going on as well throughout that whole process where she's just trying to be free and be herself. You know, that's and that's so true. People tend to, you know... Um, imprison themselves in one way or another if there's some sort of you know unhappiness or some secrets or some you know things that are going on yes some people um, may cut themselves off from everybody or some some people may drink too much or some people may eat too much or but but in the book the her weight was like her the last level of her imprisonment that she that she wanted to come out of Mm -hmm. you know and so she had the actual prison walls and she had the prison of you know, what society was saying and some of it was, you know, very dangerous to be, you know, in love with a girl in the 1920s in rural Texas was not, you know, was not a welcoming space. And so, you know, the last level of it was, was a very personal level. And that was something that we all, I think, have to deal with, you know, when, when we are not being authentic or when we aren't allowing our own voices to be heard, it has a negative effect on us in some way, whether we get angry or, we can't sleep or we develop bad habits or, you know, these sorts of things. And so I think that was in her case. Yeah. In her case, she's just sort of, you know, it, it developed a lot around food that she had to ultimately break away from. 
Well, and, you know, and that speaks to people regardless where you are on your, you are on your path. And I can see that's why, it, you know, Sugarland is being um, such a popular book and why so many people are buying it. And you have this huge community that's really developed around it as well because people want to feel like they can be authentic in their lives regardless where they're at in, in their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. And even, you know, even this idea of, you know, being able to say what you mean or, or speak your truth, it's its really hard to do. You know, it's much easier to just sort of tell a little white lie, you know, and kind of get through. But it, but it does affect the connection of what, what's a genuine connection with people. If you genuinely cannot speak, don't feel as if you can speak your mind. Or, or in this case, this is a much bigger issue that she didn't feel like she could be true about, you know, who she wanted to spend her life with or how she wanted to be in the world. It, you know, I just think it really, it has some very deeply negative um, or challenging effects on, on the human body and mind, you know. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, I know on your website you have a fabulous trailer for the book, and I want to talk about <laughs> that a little bit. I mean, you cannot watch that, and it, I mean, it just pulls you right into the mannerisms and the characters of the book. It, it's, it's phenomenal. Oh, thank you so much. You know, my friend, Andrea Maxwell, um, I came to her and I said, you know, would you do a a little book trailer for my book? And I was thinking, you know, a little something, something like an afternoon with a camera. She's, she's very experienced. She's a director and she's, uh, she's, I think, working on Spider-Man now or something. So she's, she's in in the uh, special effects world most, most often. And then she does independent, uh, like indie directing stuff. Anyway, so she then, of course, turned it into this massive and gorgeous, like, short film. (laughs) I was expecting (laughs) almost, you know, like, little paper characters, you know, moving across the board, you know, (laughs) and she found Teresa Gallagher, who's the, um, who plays Miss Debbie, and uh, just made it into this real, real like time capsule. It, I mean, I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for anything more. It, it just, it represents the entire book literally in like three minutes. <laughs> uh, she's a genius, but um, but Teresa is just wonderful, and they actually are working with me now to develop this into into either a limited series or a film. So we'll be pitching that around in a little bit and and hopefully with with Teresa attached as Miss Debbie because she just she's just perfect right down to the pantsuit and the nails and the whole business you know <laughs> yeah I loved uh, it praise God and all <laughs> oh yeah she's like hey V and then the heavens yeah. open up I mean it's hilarious I thought uh-huh. but, uh, that's all that's all Andrea Oh my goodness, she did such a beautiful job, and I'm not I'm not surprised because I actually thought that this I mean because it's so well written and such a great story, it's easy to see where this would be picked up as a movie, you know, and, or you know a series or what have you. It's very good, so very excited for you, and I'd love to hear Thank when you. that when that actually does get picked up because I'm sure it'll be happening anytime soon. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh, let's keep that thought going. <laughs> the process can be a little long in the film world, but yeah, I, w- I would love it. It would, I would be, nothing would make me happier than to, than to see this. Um, probably ideally maybe as a limited series just because it does, you know, it does cover, you know, 55 years. That might be hard to do in a film, but they do it all the time. But, um, you know, yeah, we're we're really excited about that. Yeah, they, they, you know, it's interesting because it does bring this all together. And when we talk about, you know, the main character of the book, I mean, she eventually, you know, at, at the young age of 65, finds love <laughs> and, you know, mm-hmm. right. and is, is able to, like, just be herself. And as you're saying, she's got her pugs and her trailer and there's nicknames for mm-hmm. all sorts of great things. But it's the mannerism that you wrote this in that you, it brings a reader in and makes them feel like they're actually there. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Thank. It's so nice to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, it's very exciting. Very exciting. Well, and so with all this great stuff, you know, what what do you want the reader? And I know we've covered quite a bit, but what would you like the reader to take away from your book? Hmm. <clears throat> well. Um, I really hope that in, I guess in the same way that I was inspired by, by Lead Belly, who then inspired Dara, I want Dara to really be an inspiration for people, you know, just to, 
you know, to not not be down on yourself. You know, we're we're all not not as truthful as I think we'd like to be, or most of us are. And and you know, and to just see see your journey alongside hers, you know, and and just to look for the joy and be as honest as you can. And uh, you know, and, and also you know, take take a minute, you know, take a minute to enjoy your time and to appreciate the you know, the, don't be so hard on yourself, you know. And I think that. She was hard on herself in the story for a little while there, being unable to be there for, you know, for people the way she wanted to. And you you just, you, you can't, you can't change the past, you know, just enjoy the present and be as honest as you can and, and have a good time. Well, I think that's something, you know, that everyone um, would enjoy taking, you know, into their lives is having just more fun, not take things so seriously. And, and your book really is a great outline for people to do that well you know tammy lean you know thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today i really appreciate all all your time too this was lovely chatting with you well thank you tammy lynn it has been such a pleasure to spend this time with you and of course to talk about your new book sugarland now, Sugarland's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And make sure to drop by Tammy's website at TammyLynnStoner.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guests and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information. <laughs>